Welcome back to the uh, history of nearly everything or as we like to call it story of nearly everything. So what is the theme? What is the story that I'm planning to share with you today? Uh, if you have read newspapers of late, I'm sure you would see that uh, females have recently been granted uh, a permanent commission in the uh, army, in the defense forces. So that got us thinking that this is a major win. For a movement which is called as a feminism and hence we decided to have a look at a, uh, a comprehensive history of feminism from our perspective a well-educated indian perspective this is what we aim to cover here which will operate within the parameters of upsc i would try and give you the evolution of this entire ideology right from ancient times till the modern times, till the current state, globally as well as within India. The task is uh, quite tough, the task is quite tough, only you can decide uh, how good or how bad uh, I managed to do it. Chalye, let's find out. The advocacy of uh, female rights, the advocacy of female rights on the grounds that both sexes, both uh, sexes, the genders are equal, right? This is a, uh, called as a feminism, feminist thought. The word feminism itself was uh, coined by Charles Fourier. Charles Fourier, he was a utopian socialist and he coined this term in 1830s, right? Uh, but the term was not able to gain a lot of popularity, popularity till the time a very talented and famous uh, Hollywood actress, Catherine Hepburn, she used this term in one of her movie scenes. And then the literati, the paparazzi, everybody picked it up and uh, uh, you know, is term ko kafi popular kiya. Main haath pair bohat zada hilata hoon padhate samay. I know, but uh, you know, excitement control karna mushkil rehta hai mere liye. I do get passionate at times about what I teach. Uh, apologies if it is, uh, you know, in any which way sort of, uh, uh, you know, distracts you. Uh, that's not the intention, right? Generally, I've had a classroom. I hope you can understand. Anyway, so uh, moving on, if you see in the context of the subcontinent, if you see in the context of the subcontinent, then maybe you can say that those females who broke the stereotypes, who challenged the patriarchy, they were the feminists. Right? So if you, if, you, if you look at that kind of a definition, then Rishika, this is one word which we encounter in our Vedic literature. Rishika seem to be of very much importance here. Maybe these are our earliest, uh, you know, uh, independent minded females. People such as Gargi, Maitreya. This is where you hear about uh, them in the early and the later Vedic age, right? In fact, uh, uh, some of them, like, like Gargi, Gargi is considered to be one of the best philosophical mind of ancient times, right? In one Shastrarth kiya tha, in ke saath, Yagya, Valkya, who is considered as one of the earliest philosophers of ancient India, jinhone, Karma theory propound kari thi, Upanishads mein. Right? So she challenged uh, 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 Yagya Valkya. Yagya Valkya assumed ki a debate competition is so I have won. And I must get the hundred cows, the golden cows. And he asked his shishya, ki sab le chalo yara, to hamko kaun challenge karega? 
arose this female and uh, uh, you know she made quite a spectacle right that's gargi and uh, yagya valkya shastrarth as it is often called uh, if you look at in the western context if you look at in the western context then we start noticing some very interesting trends uh, jaise ki uh, this book the republic written by plato somewhere in around uh, 400 bce right he writes that women they possess natural capacities unke andar prakritik capacities hain just like men and they can govern and defend greece as well as men their counterparts this is plato arguing back in 400 bce right and they can also be women can be the members of highest class those who rule and fight so plato said that and we have finally accepted plato's argument and uh, uh, accorded our women the right to kill in the name of uh, the ideology of uh, nation right interesting interesting uh, this can very well be an essay topic this can very well be an essay topic right okay any which way Aage hai. Uh, women you know in history as well we find them at times reacting to the patriarchy you jo pitra uh, 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 you know uh, dominant samaj tha, patriarchy so the women will often revolt to that how so let me just uh, quote a couple of examples maybe here just to make it interesting right not to make it abstract for example we are being told in rome around 200 bce they had this uh, law called as lex opia the women's wealth was supposed to be curtailed. Women were not allowed to own a lot of wealth and also not display a lot of wealth. The women reacted violently. Right? And finally, these laws, they had to be taken away. These laws had to be repealed. And see, such was the attitude, such was the attitude. One of the consul, Roman consul, he said, as soon as they begin to be your equals, they will become your superiors. Such was the fear of the opposite gender. If you look at Indian context here, if you look at Indian context here, the uh, earliest feminist thought, right, from historical time period comes out of South India and this is Andal. Who is Andal? Andal is the Alvar saint. You understand Alvar and Nayanar, right? So Andal was one of the 12 Alvar saints, the only female in the group, right? She and uh, her dad, both of them were Alvar saints. And whatever they have written, I mean, she has also written a lot. His, uh, her dad has written a lot. And their songs form a major uh, portion of Divya Prabandham, which is the collection of Alvar Singh's writing, Bhakti literature of South India. The point is, this is Bhakti ki baat ho rahi hai, to isme main feminism kahan se dhun le raun? Why am I talking about it in the context of feminism? Because a lot of people after reading her writings, a lot of uh, psychologists and better qualified people than me, they have come to this uh, understanding that Andal, right? She chose to get uh, symbolically married to Kanan. Kanan is basically South Indian name of Krishna. So as to avoid 
the monotony of household life, housewife life. She wanted to not get into that rut. And it is because of that that she composed a couple of her writings and you can see that aspect coming out of her writings. So she's, she's Andal, right? And see, this is Kanan, also known as Perumal or Thirumal. These are various names. And he was worshipped as the true form of Vishnu. And he, I mean she, she wrote lots of songs about, and you know, about Krishna, about Kanan. And asserted that she is now married to Kanha. Just like Mirabai will do later. Just like Mirabai will do much later. Mirabai's uh, act was also uh, less of an act of bhakti and surrender, more of an act of uh, uh, standing up for what she believed was right. Right? This is your uh, Thirumala temple, right? Or uh, Tirupati temple, the famous Tirupati Laddu, also known as Naivedyam. Right? This is dedicated to Tirumala. This is this is the black god. This is this is Kanan, right? Or Perumal as he is called as. Andal, right? Andal. Please understand, I am trying not to highlight uh, Andal's prominence as an Alvar saint. That's beyond doubt. But there are other works of her as well. They focus a lot on her erotic, uh, you know, uh, understanding, the way she is describing that. Right? And uh, that somewhere must be very, very liberating. Imagine this female in 7th and 8th century CE. Right? And in her own little way, she is uh, uh, starting a struggle. Inspirational. Andal, right? Uh, there were other, of course, some very wonderful females that, you know, our mythology, our legend, our history is interspersed with. Just to name a few, I'm sure most of you will be aware of them, right? Uh, Draupadi, Sita, Razia Sultan, Padmavati, Ahilya Bai, Chand Bibi, Lakshmi Bai, Hazrat Mahal. A lot of them. I will not be going into their details. That's not the objective here. Our objective is to span the entire evolution, right? Coming back to the West focus karunga because I want to explain to you the entire wave paradigm. Once you have that in your place, then rest of the discussion will be very easy for us to uh, you know flow ahead. So Abizra may West ke concept me agar baat karo. So West, me, I was telling you that Plato was like, you know, a mind-blowing character. He said that, you know, women have the same rights. But, uh, but then things were not uh, very uh, hunky-dory there as well. There also patriarchy was ruling the chart. And uh, we do not find any uh, major creations of uh, literature coming uh, during the Dark Ages. Now there's this female, her name is uh, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, but yeah, she's extremely famous, she's extremely famous and uh, she has written this book called as The Second Sex. I will be talking about that book, right? And uh, whatever she says in terms of feminist thought, it is considered, uh, you know, she's considered quite an expert in her field. So, uh, according to her, there were very few pe people who were uh, inspired by feminist thought in Europe during the medieval ages. During the medieval ages, there were hardly any examples, right? Uh, this is being cited as the first feminist work of Western tradition in the medieval times, right? This is the first work. All right, this, this is considered as the first work, uh, the book of the city of uh, ladies written by Kristen 
D. Pizan, I think it came out somewhere in 14th or 15th uh, the century, right? And uh, during the Renaissance, other, you know, people also started joining them. Certain men also started encouraging equal rights for females. Margaret Cavendish is one interesting figure. She was a duchess. She was a duchess from Britain. And, uh, you know, she was known for her uh, feminist thought. She was a philosopher, a poet. And she also wrote several plays and a scientist as well. Can you believe it? A fiction writer too. She was the first female to publish in her own name. Before this, uh, you know, these uh, females were not able to publish in their own names. For social reasons, obviously, females were not supposed to be uh, educated and writing, etc. She is a part of 17th century British society. Then came your 18th and 19th century, the era of enlightenment. And uh, now many, you know, several intellectuals, female, male alike, they started defending the rights of women. Right. One very big name that immediately, you know, comes to mind is uh, Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian. Right. He's the father of utilitarian thought. And he said that, you know, uh, for a society to exploit half of its population makes no sense. We should give them the same freedom as the other half. That will be most pleasurable for everyone and least painful for everyone. Because this is he's a utilitarian, so he always uses this pleasure pain language, right? Uh, then came your the big you know political event and uh, if you have studied French Revolution American Revolution I'm sure you would agree Mahilao ki bhumika thi they played an important part there isn't it so in uh, 1789 they have came up with this uh, uh, declaration of the rights of a man and a citizen and, you know, they wrote man in a very specific sense. Females and kids, they were actually treated as property. So, taking a stab at this, taking a stab at this, some of the women, they came up with an alternate document just a couple of years later. The name you need to remember here is Olympus, right? Olympe de Gouges. Right? She is the one who wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Women. And as you can understand, during this time, the reign of terror was going on. Jacobin Club. They were at the helm of the affairs. And they did not like when she, you know, was, uh, 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 you know, writing such pamphlets and distributing them. She was arrested, tried and executed by the guillotine. Why? Because she spoke about the rights of one half of the population. Right? Sad state of affairs. Uh, after Olympe de Gouges, as we carry on moving towards the age of enlightenment, we see very vociferous voices emerging. And some, some of them are really remarkable. Uh, you know, you should know about them. And I would suggest, I would encourage, if I can encourage you to go and maybe read something on your own about them, I think uh, I have achieved the task which I set out to, right? Uh, one name that uh, immediately catches your attention. Achha, by the way, I should uh, admit that most of the discussion is within NCERT parameters, right? Nothing is beyond uh, that level. I've just updated it to an extent. And... Uh, added few more sources right so this is Mary Wollstonecraft Mary Wollstonecraft right uh, she came up with this book vindication of the rights of uh, women she and the gouges they were actually you know contemporaries and they were very vociferous critics of marriage they said that by marriage females are 
tied. Do you see? They are tied like a dog to the household chores, living a life of meaningless labor. Right? And uh, so, huge name. Huge name. Right? 19th century feminists, these 19th century feminists which we are talking about here, uh, you know, they were unhappy. Why were they unhappy? They were unhappy. They complained because of this ideal of womenhood, Victorian womenhood, which had been created and widely accepted within the society. There were such books prescribed for females describing proper etiquettes, how they should always be shy and coy. They must not be speaking in the loud voice. You get the point here, right? So the Victorian image of an ideal woman, these feminists of 19th century, they did not like it. They did not like the entire division of a public space and private space. Where the public space was associated with power, laws, politics, and which was to be dominated by men. While the private space was your home, the kids and everything which the uh, wife was supposed to take care of. And there should be strict separation of uh, roles or dichotomy. There was this dichotomy, you understand? Dichotomy, right? So they were always told about, you know, how you should be, uh, uh, you know, such etiquettes need to be followed, the housewives, how should they behave, etc., etc. discrete shoe fitting device so that nobody you know can actually see our females this was the victorian ideal womenhood such should be the etiquette I am so sorry, right? But you get the point, right? You get the point, right? So that kind of an uh, thought is uh, was being encouraged. And the feminists were not liking it one bit. Jane Austen is one name which you should keep in this uh, regard in your head, right? Jane Austen, she published several novels. And uh, she is remembered for translating feminism or for bringing feminism into fiction. She came up with some very powerful plots and characters. And there were a lot of, uh, you know, there was an uh, underhand satire on the way women were being treated largely in the society of those times. Her name, you know, novel and the names, I'm sure, uh, a lot of them have been, you know, turned into movies, both in India as well as abroad. Right? Emma, Pride and Prejudice. Moving on, chronologically, right? I have maintained the chronological flow. And uh, the idea here is, I'm just trying to give you certain names here which are carrying forward the vigil of uh, female rights, right? So the name here that you should uh, remember is Sojourner Truth, right? Sojourner Truth, she was an abolitionist and also an activist for uh, women rights. And uh, she fought a case against a white man to recover her son who had been sold into slavery and she became the first black person to win a case against a white man. Sojourner, truth, she became a symbol of resistance against slavery. 
right? Slavery was later abolished in 1833. This happens in 1828. Uh, again, another name which we should not forget here is uh, uh, Caroline Norton. Caroline Norton, 19th century Britain ki rehne wali hai. Aap dekh sakte hai, inka timeline. Uh, why I have included her name here is because you might be surprised to know this, but prior to uh, her time, prior to Norton's time, in cases of divorce, it was the dad who would get the kid. Such was the custom, such was the uh, you know legal ways. She changed all that. She forced the court to come up with the tender years doctrine, a doctrine which has now been established across the globe. That in the early years of his uh, growth, a woman's role is more critical than the dad, than the dad's role. Right? So she changed that law. Okay? Uh, Caroline Norton. She also argued about, uh, 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 you know, maintenance and those kind of things as well. Because she says that, you know what, you guys are not giving us education. You're not letting us work. And we cannot even leave you. And if we leave you, you will take our kid with you. And you will leave us without any skill. Right? A lot of men, they also played a quite commendable role, right? One name which appears important is John Neal, right? He's considered as America's first women rights lecture, lecturer. And uh, in first half of 19th century, he seems to have traveled across United States, right? Uh, arguing for female rights. He wrote certain novels, articles, spoke, used his personal relationship, went all out for the cause of women being treated as equal. He declared that men and women are intellectually equal. Right? He fought coercion, demanded suffrage. Okay, so this is a around status around 1850. Now I am going to introduce uh, 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 something which is known as the wave paradigm, right? These two females, Maggie Hum and Rebecca Walker, they gave this uh, paradigm, right? They gave this paradigm. They had initially three waves in mind. Later, uh, fourth wave has also been added. Let's try and see. First wave is 19th century entire period which we have covered was the first wave and early 20th century in fact till 1920 till 1920 first wave ended in USA in 1920 right uh, it wanted objectives what were the objectives of the first wave uh, proper uh, promotion of equal contract and property rights that means women are also free to enter into contracts and they also have the same property rights they can also dispose of their property at will they do not need some additional uh, you know uh, uh, NOCs from male relatives etc uh, it focused the first wave focused primarily on gaining Political prabhava, political power, voting rights, that was, or jise kehte hai, suffrage, that was one of the major point, right? Uh, some of the key happenings that took place in the first wave, right? Uh, one which I would like you to remember is the Seneca Falls Convention. New York, 1848, Seneca Falls Convention. Why is this important? Uh, this organization, right, uh, it was established by Elizabeth 
carry Stanton. Right? Elizabeth uh, carry Stanton. And she drafted what has been called as the Declaration of Sentiments. The Declaration of uh, Sentiments, which had around a hundred signatures of reputed people, men and women, basically indicating that ye, we, we all are equal here. Men and women should not be differentiated on the basis of gender. Right? Uh, this was the brainchild of Elizabeth K.D. Stanton. I think I might have a photograph here. This is Stanton. Elizabeth K.D. Stanton. She organized the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, another name which I would like to mention here is that of Florence Nightingale. During Crimean War, she established the Ambulance Corps and uh, very bravely managed to break a lot of stereotypes that women are not brave, they need to be sheltered, they need to be covered. She broke all those stereotypes. Although she ended up creating uh, or reinforcing few. Because she became a nurse, so they said, you know what, women are good at caring. So they did not look at the bravery part that much. So she broke some stereotypes. But on the other hand, if you look at it, certain stereotypes were reinforced as well. Right? This is Florence uh, uh, Nightingale. And as a result of this first wave, as a result of this first wave, as females became more and more uh, uh, persistent globally, uh, in West, I should say, I should not say globally, I should say in West, right? So, as they became more and more important and democracy was there, so finally, in uh, 1893, New Zealand became the first country to grant voting rights to its female uh, citizens. Soon, other countries started following uh, uh, as well. Australia and everybody did uh, pretty soon Scandinavia joined in United Kingdom they came in in 1918 and they said that women need to be more than 30 years only then they can vote and they should also have certain you know property qualifications etc men were allowed to vote from 21 itself but for women it was kept at uh, 30 so there was still that uh, idea of, uh, uh, you know, considering them inferior in any which way. Uh, finally, it was decreased in 1928. Ten years later, they, uh, you know, decreased it. They made it equal for men and women. In 1920, USA gave uh, voting rights because USA saw the contribution of women during the war. And uh, they gave them voting rights. And a lot of people say that this was the end of the first wave. Because the first wave was primarily directed towards achieving uh, suffrage. And they got it mostly in the West. That's one way to look at it, right? Uh, second wave. Achha, by the way, Deko, when I say wave, I mean these are like crests or troughs here. This was the time when they became very powerful. The current was, you know, flowing uh, in the, you know, in uh, other times as well. During other times as well. Asa nahi ki wave ke duration mein hi movement tha. There were other good, very interesting, uh, uh, you know, scholars here during, you know, intermediate times as well. What I mean to say probably. Baat ko aage badha rahe so, I want to say that the second wave, it began in around 1960s or 1963. Uh, and it started saying that, uh, you know, it said that, you know, okay, it's not just about political rights. All kinds of discrimination need to go away. The cultural inequality needs to go away as well. 
क्या मतलब हुआ आओ जरा समझने की कोशिश करते हैं दे आर प्राइमरिली सेइंग दैट द पर्सनल लाइफ एंड द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ योर पर्सनल लाइफ दे आर आल्सो पॉलिटिकल इन नेचर फॉर एग्जांपल व्हेन अ वुमन in his in her personal space she is being dominated by her dad by her father by her son by her brother then she will never be able to have any political power outside the house as well voting rights aapne de bhi diye unko they have they, they do not have the education and the people around them the men folks they will not allow them to act independently they will make them vote as per their ideology their opinion you see the point right you see the point so during the second uh, phase 60s began in 1960s and it actually is going on in fact right uh, began in 1960s and uh, the slogan became that the personal is the new political a lot of women liberation movements emerged right a lot of women liberation movements emerged in the second wave okay fair enough acha uh, this is happening the second wave is happening in 1860s isn't it so uh, this is also the, i'm so sorry 1960s this is also the time of uh, your uh, entire uh, martin luther king uh, junior he is also active here because the entire civil rights activist activism is also going on here so the second wave feminists they are aware about uh, the problems of black females as well i will come to it i'll come back to this point in a moment uh, third wave pehle paradigm thoda sa jaan lete hain ah uh, so the third wave right it began from 1990s and this time a lot of feminist thought starts coming from a uh, uh, third world countries and uh, post colonial societies right and they started talking about uh, the unique challenges which are faced by women living in third world countries and living in uh, colonial pre colonial societies so they are basically saying that women should not be uh, looked at only with the perspective of uh, white urban uh, educated west educated women it's women as a category is not um, you know monolith just like men is not so we need to uh, understand it differently uh so the third wave saw focus uh, criticized the third wave criticized the second wave that you guys have overemphasized on uh, white females right fourth wave fourth wave is said to have begun from 2012 and uh, it uses internet and social media to combat sexual harassment and rape culture best example which i could trace out was the hashtag me too movement right where females across the globe participated in this movement right so these are your three plus one uh, waves of feminism right aage badha rahe hain baat ko this is florence nightingale in her old age some important thinkers of second and third wave which i think uh, we all should be aware of aao zara jante hain one name which you should be aware is uh, helen keller 
Helen. Uh, Kel who is she? Uh, she was uh, an American who was uh, deaf and blind when she was just 19 months old. She became deaf as well as blind. Right? And uh, uh, still she went on and uh, with the help of her companion Anne Sullivan, she managed to uh, do wonders. She started learning, reading, writing and uh, she became the first deaf blind person to get a degree of BA, a graduation degree. Right, so that was something which was uh, miraculous. And then he, he then then she toured. Right? She toured a lot. She went to more than thirty-five countries. She interacted with so many people, including Mahatma Gandhi, and thus changed the way people perceived not only women but also human beings. That how much of uh, you know inner strength do we have if we can conquer so many of uh, handicaps so she was like a, you know a remarkable phenomenon right uh, some of the names here that you should keep in mind uh, first as i have already talked about her this is a uh, simone de beauvoir uh, she has written a very interesting book called as The Second Sex. She is a French woman and the book came out in 1949. It has a, uh, uh, she's considered a kind of a Marxist, right? And she uses Marxist thread in her arguments against patriarchy. Uh, several of her works. several of her works and uh, all of them have become very very popular okay uh, after uh, Simone de Beauvoir <laughs> after the next author that I will uh, you know that the next thinker the next feminist thinker that I need to talk about here is uh, Betty uh, Friedman uh, she wrote a very wonderful work which is called as the Feminine Mystique. Look at the cover. How she has intentionally blurred the features of the wife, the woman, the mother. Because these are the roles through which a woman's identity has been reduced to. And, and it is believed that by fulfilling these roles somewhere mystically, she will be able to find fulfillment uh, in uh, her life and uh, attain nirvana. So she ridiculed such arguments. Look at the name of the book, The Feminine Mystique. And uh, this book, it is believed, it came out in 1963 and it jump-started the second wave of Feminism, the second wave of feminism, you remember P -p political, personal is political, that one, that one. In third wave, in third wave of feminism, there is this one concept which emerges. I want to explain this as well. Intersectional feminism. Kya matlab hua? Uh, you remember I told you that in third wave people were saying that, you know, uh, third world countries ki women ka experience different hai, uh, colonial societies ka different hai, so on and so forth. So, uh, intersectional uh, 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 feminism, it primarily says that uh, your identity has multiple parameters. Jaysay bhai, meri identity kya hai, main ek male hoon, right? Uh, make uh, uh, upper caste so called hum. okay and uh, uh, main ek hindu hum. i am uh, uh, you know north indian i am a hindi bhashi kind of a person these are my identities right these are my identities now the point is these identities intersect and they either increase or decrease your life chances. 
a woman of high caste has two identities ek to gender ki uski identity aur ek upper caste ki uski identity so this upper caste identity will help her to somewhere negate the you know problems of uh, you know related to gender discrimination but now think about it from the other way agar ek dalit mahila hai ya ek muslim mahila hai aur ek garib dalit mahila hai ek garib muslim mahila hai do you see how it is going to oh, the problem is going to be aggravated this is called as intersectional feminism and this kind of an outlook has been really useful right in trying to understand that uh, how can we break down feminism and understand it uh, in a more peaceful manner right uh, the fourth wave as i was trying to tell you in that pamphlet uh, in that you know uh, slide as well uh, the basic essence of fourth wave is this it's the incredulity that such attitudes still exist among people such as casting couch right people people expecting uh, sexual favors right uh, all that came out in the entire uh, me too movement which we witnessed aaiye baat ko thoda aage badha rahe hain and now i am planning to look at how feminism and feminist thought has developed in india ab iska bhi ek historical study banta hai yahan pe west ko samajh liya humne ab ek bar india mein jo development hue hain i would try and speak on those lines so let's try and start jab angrez bharat mein aaye when they were advancing into india when they were con conquering controlling right one princely state after another at that point of time there were several females who were at the helm of these kingdoms indicating that women were not absolutely null and void of power in certain pockets women did have uh, uh, a lot of political power as well uh, of course rani lakshmi bai begum hazrat mahal uh, rani chinamma uh, kittur wale aur ye hai aapki jind kaur punjab wale all of them if you look at it they were very powerful and capable rulers in their own might right hmm. so uh, if we try and typeify indian feminism in this wave kind of paradigm to fourth wave to common rahegi apni samajh mein aati hai bhai wo to internet hai sab connected hai common hai indians also participated in me too isn't it uh but for first three we have to slightly carefully realign ourselves not much but still we need to understand the nitty gritties india mein to bhai hum log alag alag tarike se exploit karte hain na mahilaon ko we have our own unique ways so but let's try and see how successful indian females have been in their entire uh, 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 vigil aao uh, janne ki koshish karte hain so first dekho pehli cheez ye jaan lena beta in case of india unlike in west in case of india uh, most of the early reforms which took place uh, was done uh, most of the reforms which took place women female reforms which took place were done on the insistence and demand of men women joined slightly later they joined slightly later sabse pehle feminism jo aaya wo maharashtra mein aaya india in terms of how modern term is understand understood right samajhna meri baat hai chaliye aage badh rahe hain so uh, 
The first phase can be categorized for our purpose as this 1850 to 1915. 1850 to 1915, right? Uh, unlike in West, mostly this was motivated with the works of reformers such as Raja Ram Mohan Roy or Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, Keshav Chandra Sen, Behramji Malabari, right? So such reformers played a very important role and gradually their wives, their sisters, their daughters or their students would also join. Right? That's how it was proceeding in the early times. Uh, the second phase is from 1915 to 1947. This is the time when India, uh, ki bhavana mein ot proto ho chuke the. we were absolutely, uh, you know, nationalism was on. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, female related aspects and issues, they were somewhere sidelined. Rashtra Bhavana Jagi. At the same time, somewhere, the idea of revival of ancient culture, Hindu culture, also started emerging in a big way. And Usmifir Bhai. Jesse Victoria me be Britain me ideal Victorian womanhood banayata. Yahape kya banayagya? Adarsh Bharti Nari. Right. You, you see how uh, you know patriarchy operates. Uh, it's a wonderful system if you see. It's a wonderful system the way it operates. It's a wonderful system. Uh, and it ended up, uh, it ends up making the victims, the watchdogs, somehow. Your moms, your sisters, elder sisters, aunts, they will be the most staunch supporters of patriarchy. Because they have been, you know, brainwashed into believing this way. Maybe we will get time to uh, you know, talk about this. So uh, under Gandhi, uh, a lot of women started joining it because Gandhi came up with the idea of non-violence. And uh, with the idea of non-violence, he said that you know what, women uh, can absolutely join. Large number of women joined. So in a way, Gandhi gave women a larger share in the public space. Give them a chance to uh, share political power. But in the other sense, she, uh, Gandhi also, you know, reinforced the stereotype. Unhone kaha ki bhai, women have an inherent tendency of giving care. They can sacrifice. Tyag ki murtiya hai ye sab. So qualities such as ambition, they were discouraged among women. Other Shabharti and Nari Mehe Sab Nahi Hona Chahiye. Right? Uh, uh, post-1947, Dheere uh, Dheere Skob or Kaise Parity Deni Chahiye, how much, you know, we can give equality of treatment to men and women in public space. This is what we are targeting. Right, let's let's uh, look at these waves in slightly more detail and meet some wonderful personalities and I think then we will be able to close this video. Uh, as I was telling you, Maharashtra is the place where it all began for India. Feminism in India originated in Maharashtra. Savitri Bai Phule, the great Savitri Bai Phule, she is considered as mother of uh, Indian feminist thought. Ye Jyotiba Phule ki bivi thi. And uh, uh, both of them, right, both of them, uh, they established uh, uh, schools, the first female school of India in 1848 in Pune. Bidewadi, that was the name, I guess, right? Savitri Bai Phule, uh, uh, 
a friend right what's her name I'll, I'll tell you her name as well Fatima Begum Sheikh so these two females these two females Fatima Begum Sheikh in fact this you know the school which they finally opened which was called as indigenous library was opened in this in the building of uh, Fatima's house and uh, together they started teaching females they started teaching uh, females of a uh, lower caste people as well and such was the uh, such was the limit of uh, uh, cultural hegemony when they started uh, when they opened this uh, entire uh, school their own community people they started to testing Brahmins ne to kiya hi. during this time education was something which was only uh, under male and Brahmin males, uh, you know, uh, custody. And now all of a sudden, these two people are opening school. So Brahmins protested. They did not like it. Stones, dung, what, what not was thrown at these two ladies. But they continued teaching. They continued teaching. Right? See, these are the first two kids which they had. First two students uh, which they had. And this school which she opened along with her husband and Fatima, can you believe it? These guys were teaching kids history. They were teaching them mathematics. They were teaching them uh, science. They were not teaching them uh, Shastra, Ved, uh, Ye, no. They were giving them modern education on the lines of West. This was a crazy experiment, right? Savitri Bai, Pule. Savitri Bai Pule is considered as the uh, first uh, female teacher of India. First female teacher of India, right? And uh, uh, University of Pune. It has been renamed as Savitri by Pule University. Okay. Uh, however, we do not find much mention of her. She has not written much. We have a lot of letters of uh, uh, Savitri and uh, Jyoti, Jyotiba. Right. So we have a lot of letters which were exchanged between these two. So through that we are able to call out some information about Fatima as well. But seems to be a very intriguing character. Uh, she is born 1831 uh, so remember right 1831 that means that means that means anniversary hai. right 170 above 180 hogi right check uh, she is married Savitri Bai was married to Jyotiba, Jyotiba Pule when she was just 9 when she was just 9 and together the Pule's, the Pule couple, Jyotiba and Savitri Bai, they established the Satya Shodhak Samaj. Because Jyotiba believed that these societies such as Brahma Samaj and Arya Samaj, they are only trying to claim the superiority of Vedic Hinduism and upper caste people. So my organization will be known as a Satya Shodhak, researcher of the truth. And she dies in 1897. Can you believe it? There was this very infamous plague which took place in India in 1890s, uh, you know, second half. And uh, she died when she was taking care of the plague patients. She also contacted plague and she died. Savitri by one person with whom you can really uh, feel associated with. This is a Madhubani painting of her. Uh, Savitri ji. Dekho, 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 dekho. Look at the painting carefully. Kaise dikhaya ja raha ki dekho. Females are being subjected to exploitation. See what this guy is doing. Isko bichari ko band karke rakha. 
इसको देखो क्या करवा रहे हैं बर्तन साफ करवा रहे हैं बच्चे से राइट एंड लुक एट दी अदर साइड सी ऑल दीज ब्यूटिफुल गर्ल्स दे आर सिटिंग डाउन एंड स्टडिंग देखो ये यहां पे लैपटॉप से पढ़ रही है बच्चे सो ऑन दी दिस साइड दिस इज वॉट यू नो सावित्री जी इज विजन लुक लाइक Another very important name for us is Tara Bai Shinde. She is considered to have written India's first feminist text. It is called as Stri Purush Tulna. ये book बेटे 1882 में published हुई थी in Marathi language. It was published, right? And uh, uh, this is considered as the first feminist text of India. she blamed the hindu religious scriptures he she said that the dharma shastra itself is the source of patriarchy a very strong barb at the vedic uh, religion and its uh, supremacy right she was one of the founding members of satya shodhak samaj right the book analyzed this stri purush tulna it analyzed see how wonderful the uh, theme is something which is so relatable for women every day of their life i believe she is talking about the tight rope which women must walk matlab unko apne charitra ko kitna ek khas straight jacket mein rakhna hoga taki wo good woman बनी रहे एंड दे डू नॉट बी लेबल्ड एज अस्टिट्यूट बिकॉज दैट्स वॉट यू नो समेर वी ऑल डू राइट इट्स वेरी इजी टू पुट इन लेबल्स टू पीपल इट्स वेरी इजी मैंने भी खूब किए हैं करते ही हैं बट या इट्स वेरी इजी टू पुट इन लेबल्स दिस इज पंडिता रामाबाई सारस्वती my objective here is to make you meet some of the most inspirational female figures of our history right in the context of feminism okay so uh, this is pandita ramabai saraswati uh, she got these titles pandita and saraswati from uh, university of calcutta after she was uh, uh, examined by the faculties and when they were completely convinced they gave her these titles and uh, she is the first female to get this title right pandita ramabai saraswati uh, criticized patriarchy and caste system inhone apne caste ke bahar ja ke shaadi kar li and in 1880s she married a christian right she married a christian ye marathi speaking chit pavan do you realize chit pavan are you know they consider themselves to be very pure so she came from that background so for her to break all those cult you know standards of behavior must have been quite tough must have been quite tough kyunki chit pavan brahmans apne ko jitna pure samajhte hain utna hi orthodox bhi hote honge at least some of them right this society was uh, so uh, you know these were some of the important names there right there kya kya bola maine tumhare samne savitri bai phule these are the guys who were responsible for feminism in maharashtra uh, and pandita rama bai and uh, tara bai shinde right these are three names here uh, a couple of you know other variables that you need to keep in mind is uh, that uh, the bengali reformers such as raja ram mohan roy and you know others they were focusing their energies on abolishing these uh, practices which were uh, you know not making any sense at all now for example sati सती मालूम है ना भाई सती हम लोग को मालूम है चाइल्ड मैरिज अबॉलिशिंग द डिसफिगरिंग ऑफ विडोज विडोज के पहले नाक या कान काट लेते थे 
सो द आइडिया वॉज की जो विधवा है द विधवो विद विडो हर लाइफ शुड बी मेड सच अल दैट शी प्रिफर्स टू कमिट सती right so uh, such you know uh, regulations were removed and uh, they also tried to have them uh, law give basic rights gradually uh, the wives daughters and everyone they started joining in of the reformers uh, some some facts that you should know here chandramukhi basu and kadambini ganguli they are considered as the first females to get a ba degree to get a graduation degree in india they did it from uh, uh, calcutta university they did it from calcutta university and they are considered as uh, first indian females this lady uh, chandramukhi basu and they both graduated in 1882 so chandramukhi basu she went on and she completed her ma she is known as the first female to uh, do an ma while kadambini ganguli she was the first female to enter calcutta medical university calcutta medical college and earn a doctorate so first female doctor is kadambini ganguli right that's kadambini ganguli 1861 she was born so that is why uh, a few days back i believe google came up with this doodle about her kadambini ganguli so something which is in news and uh, it is making numerical sense as well because typically you must have noticed right 150 160 type ki anniversaries pe thoda zyada focus rehta hai so maybe we can just keep it in our heads right uh so uh if somebody asks you that who is the earliest female doctor from india remember there are two people who did it in the same year one is kadambini ganguli and the other one is anandi joshi look at her timeline can you believe it she died when she was 22 right and both of them they uh, got their degree together okay anandi joshi and uh, your uh, kadambini ganguli they are considered as the earliest female doctors of india this is kamini roy she was a poet and a suffragette that means she wanted uh, voting rights for female she fought for voting rights for female and uh, she is considered as the first woman honors graduate in india 1886 kuch information thi i thought i'll share it with you it can confuse you at times for a prelims question that's all uh Rukma Bai another very famous name she is also one of the earliest doctors matlab kadambini lok ke batch ke baad ki hi hai right kadambini and anandi joshi ke baad ke batch ki hai ye rukma bai she is known not only for being one of the earliest doctors but she is also known for a very famous case case associated with restitution of conjugal rights right restitution of conjugal rights where uh, uh, her husband who was uh, uh, you know not much of uh, you know uh, i should say some very negative opinion about his character exists and uh, he was insisting that by law uh, rukma bai's dad must send rukma bai to uh, his place because they need to consummate the marriage but rukma bai and rukma bai's father their stance was that uh, you are good for nothing and your attitude uh, is also you know not at all uh, correct so we do not intend to carry ahead with this uh, marriage 
after a long time, finally a lot of people believe that it was Queen Victoria herself who dissolved the uh, marriage of Rukmabai. Rukmabai wrote, uh, uh, gave a very wonderful interview as well. And uh, her case, it attained a lot of uh, popularity. People such as uh, Tilak, Behramji, Malabari, they all got involved into the case. And uh, finally, it is because of this case that uh, Age of Consent Act was passed. She was very young when she was married off. So they decided that, you know what, we need to change this law. and We need to, you know, change the minimum age. They increased it. And a lot of people did not like it. custom or traditions ke sang kyon khel rahe family law ke sang kyon khel rahe Why are you interfering? We will, hum log apne aap kar lenge jo problems hai sahi. Aap, aap mat boliye beech. So this kind of an attitude started developing. And this harmed the cause of females. This cultural revivalism, it harmed from 1890s onwards, we see a lull in activity. There was a huge, you know, issue with the age of consent act. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was very furious. He wrote a lot of articles in Swaraj and Kesari. Okay. And all that started somewhere with the, uh, 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 Dr. Rukmabai. Dr. Rukmabai. 1920s ke dashak se dheere dheere, we are being told that right from the decades of 1920s, there, were, um, there was emergence of local female organizations. Right? They, they were localized, they were specific to a region. But certain such mahila samitis, Associations started emerging. In Madras, it cropped up. In Andhra, it cropped up. Cropped up. And by 1927, by 1927, with the efforts of a, a lady known as Margaret Cousins, Ireland ki thi, and uh, she, right? She was the one who was, uh, you know, uh, 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 instrumental in the creation of All India Women's Conference 1927. This was a conference which was closely, it was a woman organization, closely affiliated to Congress. Because Gandhi wanted more and more participation of women. Mobilization of women was a major important tool of our national movement was a major important tool of Gandhian methodology. Strategic reasons ki se, right? So, uh, All India Women's Conference was established here. Decades of 1930s and 40s in India witnessed rise of a uh, uh, Marxism and influence of Marxism in feminist thought. So now people started talking about a more radical look. Right now, now the feminist thought starts becoming more radical. Uh, Mahila Atma Raksha Samiti. This is what was established uh, by CPI when the World War. Second World War was going on. So they created this armed wing. Mahila Atma Raksha Samiti. After independence, this Mars, right? It became in 1954, CPI, it started calling it as National Federation of India, Indian Women. CPI ne. 42 mein jo banaya tha, usse Mars keh rahe te. It, was, it was called as Mars. And in 54, they changed the name to this National Federation of Indian Women. Right? Uh, 
Finally, we got our independence, right? We got our independence. Uh, there was only, there were only 15 females in the constituent uh, assembly of India. There were just 15 females. And uh, the issue of uh, females, they once again took back seat. And once again in the name of uh, nationalism. Right? Or usko ek bar fir se dar kinar kar diya gaya. There were just 15 females in uh, the constituent assembly out of 392 members. Right? So let's have a quick look at a few of them which I find interesting, which I think you can remember. Uh, photograph of some of them here, a group photograph. Let's have a look at them individually. This is a Dakshayani Vela Yudhan. This was the only Dalit woman. So do you see how much of an exploited group she is representing? She was the first female of her family to wear an upper cloth apni chhati dakne ke liye, to cover her breasts. Her ancestors were not allowed. Right? Uh, she came from Madras, by the way. Right? Uh, very wonderful. Very wonderful. And also she was the youngest. She was also the youngest Dakshiani Vela Yudhan. Uh, this is of course very popular Hansa J. Mehta, Jeevraj Mehta. Uh, she is very popular. Why? Because uh, uh, she changed the entire wordings of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. 1948, the United Nations, right? So it said that all men are created equal. So, uh, she said, no, hang on. All human beings are created equal. Right, stop using the word men to represent uh, every one of us. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was wife of Roosevelt, she accepted uh, 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 Mehta's point of view and uh, the text was accordingly changed. This is Hansa, uh, Jeevraj Mehta. She also made some very important contribution in the constitution for women rights. Right, how so? She along with Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, another important name, right? Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, they modeled the Indian women's charter of rights and duties. Ki bhartiya mahilao ke adhikar kya hai? Aur humare zimmedariya kya hai? Iska inhone ek charter tayar kiya. They fought for uniform civil code. One of the two most vociferous uh, voices for uniform civil code are these two females uh, Hansa Mehta pushed for abolition of child marriage which led to the passage of Sharada Act right uh, she was also against she campaigned against the Devadasi system and uh, also personal law reforms and personal law reforms this is uh, Amrit Kaur. She was also a member of Constituent Assembly. And uh, she went on to become the first uh, uh, Health Minister of India from 1947 to uh, 57. First Health Minister of Independent India. And uh, she's also credited with establishing the uh, prestigious AIMS institutions. Rajkumari Amrit. Uh, couple of more names here. This is Ammu Swaminathan, right? Again, another upper caste fellow from Madras, but she was smart enough to understand the entire equation of gender and caste. In fact, she was such a strong opponent of caste that she questioned Nehru. And she said that Nehru, you are doing wrong. You should not respond when people call you Panditji.
क्यों पंडित को आप ऑनोरिफिक टाइटल बना रहे हैं इट्स अ कास्ट नेम वाई इज इट बींग मेड इन टू एन ऑनोरिफिक टाइटल बिकॉज द मोमेंट यू स्टार्ट डूइंग इट फिर किसी और की कास्ट को आप गाली भी बना देंगे बन गया तुम्हारा कास्ट सिस्टम right so she had a very uh, you know a uh, wonderful way of looking at it this is begum ajaz rasul the only muslim female in the constituent assembly is this wonderful lady uh, she was from uh, awadh very rich talukdar family uh, this is durga bai deshmukh durga bai deshmukh uh, she was uh, the member of constituent assembly and she was later also the member of planning commission she went on to marry cd deshmukh the first governor of rbi and uh, she is known for her attempts for female education she is known for her attempts for female education here in delhi the south campus the college is called as durga bai uh, durga bai deshmukh college right the metro station is also called by the same name i believe uh another name another female this is this one is coming from uh, right from south kerala ani maskuran she was from travancore the princely state of travancore and she played a very important role in the integration of travancore by india and she was a member of constituent assembly right ani maskuran there were others as well such as sucheta kripalani vijay lakshmi pandit and sarojini naidu right i am not going to talk about them because i believe uh, then the entire session will become too long here right and i don't want to do that about them you can read in other context as well uh okay as a result of all these deliberations finally indian constitution was adopted in january 1950 and uh, it adopted a very patronizing attitude towards indian women it treated them as the weaker sex which needs uh, to be protected and uh, uh, you know to be given special advantage to make them equal so they adopted the constitution adopted a very patronizing attitude towards women right uh, the women of india got certain basic rights such as voting without any uh, you know measurable uh, resistance what do i mean bahut aasani se mil gaya hum logon ko voting rights mahilaon ko in west the women had to struggle a lot against uh, patriarchy against dominance of men but here females they got the voting rights very easily and several other rights for example property rights so they got those rights right they got those rights but law making is not the only thing i'm sure you would agree right law banane se agar samaj change ho jata to kya baat thi <laughs> that would be nice right you know so uh, uh, okay the constitution of india right you know they guarantee kiya that there should be there will be equality between sexes there will not be any discrimination based on gender and because of all this uh feminism in india sort of uh, uh, went on another lull hum log ko laga ki kaam khatam ho gaya jeet gaye but the utopia soon got uh turned into a dystopia bahut oh, jaldi turn around ho gaya aao dekhte hain kaise okay so uh, what i'm trying to tell you here is कि बेटा हमने अधिकार तो दे दिए वी गेव वीमेन द राइट्स बट द काइंड ऑफ आइडियोलॉजीज दैट वर प्रेजेंट द काइंड ऑफ आइडियोलॉजीज दैट वर प्रेजेंट सच एज नेशन एंड द काइंड ऑफ स्ट्रक्चर्स दैट वर प्रेजेंट इन आवर सोसाइटी सच एज द फैमिली 
or uh, the khap panchayat the caste etc they were not amenable to the democratic spirit and to the idea of individual uh, you know in, uh, success to the idea of fundamental rights of women as well hamari society hamara structure hamare institutions they weren't ready right they weren't ready and as a result what will happen once again feminist movement will start uh indira gandhi of course became the first female prime minister three consecutive terms and the fourth one as well but then she was assassinated uh a couple of other pointers here uh in 2005 in 2005 protection of women from domestic violence act was passed right uh the act provides a definition of do domestic violence for the first time in indian law and it tries to protect women from uh, domestic violence although i must tell you that this law doesn't have much teeth it tries to you know simply if you look at it uh, protect the women rather than any criminal enforcement first complaint pe they will try and you know treat it as a civil kind of a matter although violence must not be treated in that manner right uh, one more point which i would like to make here is uh, in 2013 government came up with another set of guidelines they are very uh, popular and something which every corporate office in india is bound to follow right uh, they are supposed to have posh committees prevention of sexual harassment at workplace uh, so this act was passed so yeah this act was passed in 2013 and uh, that's where we stand in terms of the development which have happened uh at uh, the front of uh, feminism i hope you were able to get a sense of uh, history here right a sense of story here kuch samajh mein aaya ho i hope uh, uh, in the comment box try and let me know Uh, what is it that you are uh, liking what is it that you are not liking and what is it that you expect from a series of this uh, this nature what are the other themes that you feel uh, you know we can together come up with and uh, you know uh, make a nice dish and uh, you know deliver it to you uh, keep watching the space see you around bye